When you finish every level of GoldenEye 007 on the highest difficulty, you unlock 007 mode where you can tweak four variables. Setting them all to the max creates an absurd difficulty level that speedrunners have dubbed Dark License to Kill, or DLDK. 1000% health and damage. Every single guard takes 10 headshots and you die in one hit. And they will hit you because they have 100% accuracy and inhuman reactions. Now try to play the game's most chaotic and reckless level, Silo, where you have to power your way through 65 guards in tight hallways under a ticking time bomb. This is the impossible GoldenEye speedrun, Silo DLTK, explained. I'm pretty excited to tell you about this video's sponsor. If you're a fan of this channel, then you love understanding complex concepts with intuitive visuals. That's why you really should integrate the best way to learn to your daily life, brilliant. Personally, my educational background is mostly in math. To start my YouTube channel, I've had to learn video editing, but even today, programming is crucially lacking from my skill set. I'm currently using Brilliant to learn programming with Python, which will help me in all sorts of ways. With Brilliant, the learning methods are simple and intuitive. Lessons are hands-on and bite-sized with a logical, gradual progression. It's so easy to make it a daily habit and never feel overwhelmed. And you can learn about so many different topics from probability and statistics to complex numbers, multivariable calculus, and linear algebra, and that's just a maths field. Brilliant is great if you're a lifelong learner, which, if you're watching me, I suspect you are. It's also an amazing educational supplement for teenagers. You can try it out right now completely free for 30 days by visiting brilliant.org slash bismuth. Plus, you can get 20% off the annual subscription. As always, the link is in the video description. It's often said that major achievements are made by standing on the shoulders of giants. This couldn't be more true in speedrunning, but especially in the case of Silo DLTK. To better understand this speedrun by Blaze2005M, let's take a brief look at how we got here. Dark License to Kill was first brought into the spotlight 20 years ago when Nintendo 64 speedrunning veteran Illu Dude made a post on the Elite forums. After beating the game, instead of trying to set world record times in the regular levels like normal people, Illu had been trying to complete missions on this hellish difficulty setting. As many other players joined in the quest to complete all 20 levels, Illu remained ahead of the pack in 2004 and 2005 until only 4 levels remained. Streets, Train, Cradle, and of course, Silo. But even Illu fell short. DLTK would remain at 16 out of 20 for 4 years until a renaissance was sparked by the most legendary DLTK player, who today still tops the total time leaderboard by 19 minutes, Adam Bozon. Around the turn of 2010, Adam and other members of the community, David Burkle and Eddie Lovin, solved Streets, Cradle, and Train just a couple of months apart. Train was particularly grueling to finish. Adam's first completion was 29 minutes of careful manipulation and perfect precision. Even today, Train remains the only stage that has never been finished in under 10 minutes. But even though Train is in some aspects harder than Silo, there is one thing Silo has that made completing it seem totally impossible. A time limit. On nearly every other level, you could afford to take as long as you want, but not here. You had to somehow figure out a way to safely dispatch over 60 guards in 8.5 minutes. But thankfully, Adam wasn't alone. He got valuable help from GoldenEye Tasser and Scientist Weister and Mano Cheese. Yes, the same Mano Cheese who broke open Ocarina of Time and Donkey Kong 64 15 years ago. Little by little, Adam chipped away at the level, figuring out strategies that were safe, consistent, and fast enough. Months turned into years, but finally, in 2013, after 330 hours of attempts, Adam Bozon completed the run in 8 minutes and 31 seconds, barely squeezing into the elevator with 2 seconds left on the clock. Most of the strategies used in this run were discovered by Adam Bilzon and later perfected by Brian Bosshart and Icy. Since 2013, the world record has only been lowered 5 times by 3 people, Adam Bilzon, Brian Bosshart, and Blaze M. A few notes before we begin. First, the mission objectives. Silo has 5 of them. Objective A is to plant bombs in each fuel room. That's a special object named Plastique that you need to select from the pause menu and throw in each room. Objective B is to take a picture of the satellite in the final fuel room. Objective C, obtain telemetric data, an item called DAT dropped by a scientist in the third fuel room. Objective D, retrieve satellite circuitry which are strewn about on random tables, as is common practice with unprotected circuit boards. Finally, Objective E is to minimize scientist casualties. 
in this mission you're limited to 2 out of 9 scientists, a third one is an automatic failure. During this video, to help visualize things happening beyond what we can see, I've made a tool assisted replica of the run to the best of my abilities. This will be used for various demonstrations, especially the guard luring strategies where a map view will show the guards reacting to Bond's antics. Randomness is a huge element of GoldenEye speedrunning, so this replica is bound to have pretty significant differences with the real run. Please take it with a grain of salt. Also, look out for numbered notes in the corner, like this one about the origin of the name DLDK. A link to the additional notes is in the video description. One quick word about the version Blaze is playing on. There are three different N64 versions of the game, North American, Japanese, and PAL. Japanese is considered the easiest because it has more lenient auto-aim and a full body armor early in the level. A full body armor is actually just enough to let Bond take one hit, which is quite the advantage. The North American version also has an occasional bug where a guard will freeze, which can be beneficial. PAL has none of these advantages and is in fact the version Blaze used for this run. The lower frame rate on PAL is also a disadvantage, but its impact is near negligible. This is the very first of many luring strategies Blaze will use throughout this run. Here it's quite simple, as soon as he opens that door, this guard sees Bond so he fires at him. But because Blaze closes the door and he can no longer see him, the guard runs to his position until he finds him again. While he waits, Blaze quickly pauses and unpauses the game many times. This is a technique known as quick pausing. In an attempt to not make it too tedious in levels where you have to pause a lot, the animation for pausing speeds up every time it's used, up to a cap of 6 times. In any level where you have to pause to select a tool, speedrunners use every bit of downtime they get to speed up the pause animation so that when they do need it, they get the fastest pause possible. It's especially crucial in Silo, where Blaze will need to pause 5 different times for the mission objectives. While he's taken out the first guard, Blaze makes sure to close the door on him. Enduring the first guard alerts the second one, but the door shields Bond from his line of sight, forcing him to run in as well. While taking out the second guard, he gets shot at point blank, but somehow lives. How? Well, it's because the guard is so close to Bond that he actually fires through him. Shot trajectories are calculated from the tip of the gun, and the KF-7 is a long enough rifle that when Bond stands directly up against the guard, the tip of the KF-7 ends up behind Bond, keeping him relatively safe. Once the patrol guard sees Blaze, the ceiling doesn't really provide any protection, so he needs to hide behind the wall, otherwise he'd be cooked. There are three types of guards in this level, standing, patrolling, and crate guards. Most guards simply stand in one spot until they're alerted, at which point they will set their target location to bond and run to it. Patrol guards walk back and forth along a set path until something alerts them. Using the timer in this predictable pattern, Blaze is able to know precisely where each patrolling guard is going to be at every point in the level, leaving nothing to chance. Crate guards stand behind crates for cover and will never move from this position. This guard has a superpower, he's left-handed. Luckily for Blaze this time, he had a position in animation that made him quite slow to take aim, but you don't always get this lucky. This guard is infamous for being ridiculously unfair at times. When he comes back to take him out, Blaze finds the guard reaching into his pocket. This is extremely lucky for two reasons. First, because like I said, he can sometimes get you on the first possible frame, making him virtually impossible to survive and second, because he pulls out a grenade. The only guards that can pull out a grenade are crate guards, and in the whole stage, there are only 7 of them. Whenever they get into an attack action, each guard has a range of possibilities to choose from. Crate guards have a 1 in 25 chance to throw a grenade. If they take damage before they get a chance to prime the grenade, they will drop it as they die. If they do get a chance to prime it, then the grenade can't be picked up and explodes instead. 
This is easier said than done, because while during the first animation, the guard takes quite a while to prime it, once the grenade is out, it will automatically be primed as soon as he starts another grenade animation. To prevent this, Blaze has to make sure to keep him locked in a damage animation. Guards can sometimes throw grenades from out of sight and cause major problems. Also remember that the seven grenade guards are the only ones that will always stay posted behind their crate no matter what, so they can't ever be lured out. Grenades will prove extremely useful in this run, so Blaze wants to collect three of them from the guards. Getting all three is very rare. It's the primary luck factor of the run. There's a method to maximize the chance of getting grenade drops that we're gonna see later. In this hallway, Blaze doesn't want to make too much noise and alert the guard in the next room, so he always fires single shots. With the KF-7, this can only be done by aiming with R. The grenade guard can't complete any of his damage animations, so Blaze rides a fine line between making too much noise and leaving too much time between shots. This guard is one of the few that have been named Cloner Guards. Every standing guard can theoretically do this, but in practice only a few of them can actually cause trouble. When alerted by noise, if they haven't been fully loaded yet, guards will create a copy of themselves at their location that runs towards the source of the noise. There are two ways to avoid this, by loading them before they hear you, or by alerting them via injuring a guard in their line of sight rather than by noise. This room is the perfect showcase of why Blaze wants grenades. Explosions are overpowered. The damage explosions deal to Bond is a function of his proximity in the blast radius, but for guards, the process was simplified a bit. If they do so much as lightly graze an explosion, they're gone, no questions asked. Let's break down the most vital strategy of this whole run, luring guards. There are four main ways guards can be alerted of Bond's presence, seeing him, obviously hearing noise, being shot at, or witnessing another guard be injured. The only noise that guards can actually hear is Bond's own gun. A guard can have 10 friends making an absolute ruckus two feet away, so long as Bond is silent, they won't notice a thing. Similarly, explosions don't make a noise as far as guards are concerned. The KF-7 obviously makes a lot of noise, but surprisingly, it's near silent when fired one shot at a time. Meanwhile, even the silenced PP-7 can alert guards if fired too quickly. A guard being shot at is quite obviously going to be alerted, although it's not always the case. They'll usually still be alerted even if they don't get hit if the bullets are close enough. Finally, if Bond hits any guard within another guard's line of sight, they will run to Bond's position at the moment the injured guard ends his damage animation. This means that hitting a guard with a grenade will cause every guard that saw it to run into the explosion. All of these quirks are vitally important throughout this level as Blaze abuses every aspect of the enemy AI to his advantage. Consoles blow up after taking 5 bullets, so he puts 4 in as he enters the room to make timing the explosion easier later. He makes as much noise as possible when taking out this guard to lure in 3 guards from the next hallway. They attempt to run to this point, but their pathfinding has a flaw that causes them to try to run through the railing, which they can't. So, as they're running in circles, Blaze repositions and injures them. This sets their new target position to right next to the console. They will run to this point until one of three things happens. One, they see Bond along the way, in which case they stop and open fire. Two, they reach their destination, at which point they set a new target to Bond's current position unless more than 10 seconds have passed. Or three, they get blown up. Now you might think that the guards can see Bond from here, but they actually can't. Small railings and fences act as full opaque walls in terms of guard line of sight, so they provide a huge advantage if you know what you're doing. There's one last potential issue here. The four fuel rooms have scientists in them. Generally, unless you go out of your way to harm them, scientists will be a non-issue, but in Silo, they have an impressive ability to cause trouble. Their usual behavior is to stand around uselessly until threatened by nearby fire or being directly aimed at, at which point they surrender, throw away anything they have, and run away. You typically need to collect keycards from them to progress through the level, and they do have a tendency to throw them into random quarters or to parallel universes. Scientists can also have the brilliant idea to run in front of you, blocking your shots. 
If you accidentally hit them twice, they will go rogue and open fire on you. And yes, they also have a thousand percent damage. Here we can see Blaze take full advantage of the quirk with railings and guard line of sight. Also, fun fact about this room, there's a guard in a walkway up above who's unreachable. He can hear noise and be alerted, then proceed to do nothing about it. He's standing next to a door that leads nowhere and he can never see Bond. These guards are quite dangerous because you can't get any closer to them, but fortunately you can use objects to hide behind. Because most of the guards are right-handed, if you stand close enough to the wall, even though they can see you, they actually don't have a clear line to hit you. Blaze attempts to get a grenade out of these guards, but doesn't get it. There are two guards in this room and Blaze alerts them so they run into this console explosion. He makes sure that his last bullet hits the right side of it because the explosion is centered on the final shot on the console. Hitting it to the right prevents the explosion from destroying the next console over, which will be useful shortly. However, on top of the two guards in the room, this also takes out one scientist. Here, Blaze causes mayhem in the next hallway to pull six guards to his position. He lures them to this tight spot and blows up this console to dispatch half of them. And this is why he needed to keep this console intact so he could quickly take out the remaining three guards. This is a guard that can take out a grenade. Blaze's strategy to get as many chances as possible of a grenade is to wait for him to end his damage animation, then go for a body hit. They do lower damage than headshots, allowing for up to 20 grenade opportunities. Limb hits could allow up to 40, but time and ammo are also a consideration. As soon as he sees the hand go into the pocket, he knows he's got one. The animation can be a bit tricky to spot, but there's an easier tell. If a guard is holding his KF-7 in just one hand, he must have a grenade in the other. He quickly finishes the guard off and picks up his second grenade at the run before immediately starting to put them to good use. This precise grenade throw gets five guards at once. Throwing a grenade uses both parts of his Z press. Bond primes the grenade when you press Z and he throws it when you release it. Blaze holds Z for a few seconds before throwing the grenade to use up part of the fuse timer for maximum accuracy. 
When he checks it out, it explodes quickly instead of bouncing around, hitting all four guards here, plus one on the catwalk above. The same process is repeated in this hallway. By making maximum noise, Blaze is able to gather six guards in this spot. He takes out four of them with a grenade and the other two manually. This part gets a bit dicey, with two guards being there at once, but he uses the wall for some protection. When a guard begins a firing animation, they will always finish it before repositioning. The second guard firing into the wall gives a small window where Blaze is safe to take out the first one. Now the third fuel room is empty, which makes it easy to pick up the necessary items and lure the next group of guards to his position. Thankfully, a convenient barrel of very explosive stuff is lying around. Making noise here attracts only this first guard. The second is deaf, so he only gets alerted when he sees the first one be injured. The following three are crate guards that won't move. This area is possibly the hardest of the whole stage. On one hand, Blaze wants one more grenade, so he needs one of these three guards to pull one out. On the other hand, if they do and they manage to throw it, that's pretty much run over. So he needs to take out the right guard and hope he doesn't get bad luck on the front guard in the meantime. Once that's done, he abuses the line of sight of right-handed guards and he slowly takes them out while maximizing his chances at a grenade. The back guard takes one out relatively quickly, so he never lets him get another animation in and dispatches him as fast as he can. But he can't just fire like crazy for two reasons. First, he doesn't want to make noise and alert the other guards further down the hallway. And second, the KF-7 has a lot of spread when you fire multiple shots in a row. At this distance, he'd see most of his shots miss his target, which could easily let the guard have enough time to throw his grenade or shoot at Bond. The final grenade is useful immediately, helping him take out four guards at once. Because of all the noise, one more guard runs in, which he has to wait for to be safe. And he finally reaches the satellite room, where one guard is waiting for him. Now the ending of this level should be virtually impossible in DLTK. The final hallway is teeming with enemies posted in every corner but there's a clever way to lure them out that makes it just barely possible to survive.
First, Blaze makes noise and attracts these two guards. For some reason, the ones closest to the door don't hear Bond, but when the first guard gets injured, they notice and run in as well. Then, Blaze gets stuck on a scientist for three seconds and heads over to the previous bridge. This happens to be right below the final section of the level. He fires bullets into the ceiling close to four guards, which alerts them and signals them to run to Bond's current position. He injures one of them in the line of sight of three more guards who had yet to be alerted, while making enough noise to alert this far guard, which brings a total of eight guards towards him. Clearing this whole area out is key to making the ending possible. When he comes back into the satellite room, the two closest guards from earlier are here already, and the convoy from the final bridge is on its way. He narrowly dodges them by hiding behind consoles. Heavy lag plays in his favor here. The guard's pathfinding struggles massively while Blaze is patiently hiding under the walkway where no one can see him. He completes Objective B by taking a picture of the satellite and Objective A by throwing the final plastique. Finally, he blows up the guards that were trying to reach him while the others take off to the lower bridge where they think they'll find him. Now, Oromov is here and he's unhappy. When he's alerted, he fires at Bond from a distance until he takes enough damage, until Bond gets close to him, or until 30 seconds have passed. The first two are obviously not going to happen in DLTK, so you have to wait out the 30 seconds. Unless you're going for the world record, in which case, this is what you do. Blaze runs in and prays that Ormov kneels before firing. That's a 50-50 coin flip right at the end of the run, although it is sometimes possible to get past him even if he doesn't kneel. This results in about a 70% chance of getting through. The safer strategy is to alert Ormov earlier when you first open the door and wait until he gives up and takes off running. However, it's slower because it lets him run ahead and close every door behind him. Blaze found himself a couple seconds behind his previous record at this point, so he went for the riskier approach. By now, Blaze is almost out of the woods. There are four guards remaining on this way, two behind this wall of consoles that he easily takes out, and two in the room by the elevator. Because of the shape of the centerpiece, he can run past and alert them, but by the time they start firing, he's hiding behind a wall, so it's relatively safe to run past them. And just like that, Blaze 2005M completed Silo on Dark License to Kill in 7 minutes and 30 seconds, with a full minute to spare on the timer. It's a bit cheeky to let the ending cutscene play out, because although it's pretty rare, it's actually possible for scientists to fail during this cutscene. To this day, GoldenEye on Dark License to Kill remains one of the hardest video game challenges ever and has been completed by only 9 people. Just one more person has completed Silo for a total of 10. Most players took over 100 hours of attempts to get their first completion, let alone the grueling odds of getting 3 grenades and a 1 in 25 chance per animation, the amount of ways things can go wrong in this run is simply impossible to keep track of. There's one other runner who's trying to take this world record. Therm33, who's currently setting in second place with a 750. He has made it his goal to improve the record and has had several close calls already, so there's a good chance he will take the record sometime soon. Every bit of the run has a way to go faster, which comes at the cost of consistency. With current strategies, 710 is about as good as it could get. Theoretically, it would be easily possible to get a run in the 6 minutes range, but actually going for it would be a nightmare. Three grenades is already a tough ask, but one could go for four. The well-practiced, consistent strategies come at the cost of waiting for specific moments for optimal patrol guard positions, which makes improving the record by a significant margin a much more complex problem than simply saying, just go faster. You can reach some rooms faster, but then you have to wait for patrol guards to be in the right spot. But what about tool-assisted speedruns? Well, in a test setting, you can absolutely obliterate this level. You can abuse the random factor of bullet spread and position yourself perfectly to block the line of fire of enemies. The task record for this stage is 15 years old and was set by Simon Sternis at 1 minute and 58 seconds. It's a pretty crazy run that unfortunately suffers from pretty abysmal video quality. 
but perhaps more entertaining is a task by Eliminate Xenia which kills every single guard in 3 minutes and 22 seconds using 611 headshots. This run really showcases how ridiculous you can get by testing this game. Although there's no way we'll ever see anyone match this in real time, there's still a lot of room for improvement to optimize silo DLDK. Speedrunners will take even the most impossible looking challenges and not only conquer them, but master them.